Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We're excited to have all of you here on this Friday afternoon in a packed house. Uh, today's conversation is going to be moderated by David Gergen, who's the director of the Kennedy School Center for Public Leadership. CPL, along with Harvard's Kennedy School Middle Eastern in Initiative, are co-sponsoring this event with the Institute of Politics. So please join me in welcoming David Gergen. Good afternoon and welcome to the Kennedy School Forum. We're delighted and honored that you're here. On behalf of our guest, who had a request that he and I have joined in, we'd like to begin today by asking everyone to stand for a moment of silence in memory of those Egyptians who have died in the last three days. Thank you. And I must tell you that it's a wrenching experience for our guest to be here today. You know, his heart calls for him to be in Egypt, and he had made a commitment to be in the United States, but know how difficult this is for him uh, to be here and how eager he is to be, not to be seen as, quote, the leader of the revolution. Uh, but as, as someone who was a major contributor. I, I think it's worth understanding that a year ago today, uh, our guest was, in, was imprisoned and blindfolded, unsure whether he might die at any moment in Cairo. The Egyptian security forces, and indeed the world, uh, were just awakening to the fact that he had been the anonymous figure behind a Facebook page, which he had started out of Dubai, which had an enormous impact upon young people especially, but people all across Egypt who, who had been oppressed for so long. Uh, and this Facebook page, along with uh, contributions by others, as he's so anxious to point out, was really the spark behind the revolution that started on the 25th of January a year ago, and it was just three days later that he was arrest arrested, and then that he told the security guard and the forces there who he was, and the world, the word started leaking out. And he, when he was finally released, after spending that time in agony, his wife, his children, uncertain whether they'd ever see him again, when he was finally released, he was greeted as a hero all over the world, as the heroic face of the revolution as one who had done so much for it. And that revolution, of course, has become of enormous historic significance for the world, holding out the hope to people all over the world who are oppressed that they too can find freedom and democracy. So we're honored, Wael Gonim, that you're here with us today. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Thanks. <laughs> Wael is here in part because he has uh, authored a new book, which I commend to you, the early advanced uh, uh, text. But, but there is a hardback that's just out called Revolution 2.0. The power of the people is greater than the people in power, a memoir. And you should know that uh, there's going to be a, a book signing and a chance to greet him personally at the Charles Hotel that it will start just around 5.15. We're on a fairly tight schedule here. Uh, Wael will leave here just a few minutes after 5. He'll be over there. But you'll have a chance to come over and get a book. And I'm told that the first 100 people to arrive uh, will actually be entitled to a free book. Everyone thereafter, is, uh, you're on your own. All right? <laughs> but I do, uh, I, I've had the uh, pleasure uh, of spending some hours here in the last couple of days uh, reading this book, and I commend it to you. It's a, it's a wonderful tale. And I think that for those of us who are interested and concerned about public leadership and how one leads in today's world, it's a really instructive tale. It's something that I think a lot of classes here will be studying in the future uh, of, about how someone can use the power of the social media. Now, uh, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. So let, uh, I, uh, let's turn to the star of the show. The, uh, 
Um, I'd, like to, I'd like you to tell us about your life. Let's first, so people have a sense of context of, of who you are, where you came from, how you got to be where you are. You tell that tale in long form in the book, but I, could you tell it to us in short form here now? Uh, first of all, I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's, it's very hard to be in, in the U.S. today while what's going on in Egypt. I feel uh, very uh, torn, I, I have to say, that I'm following the news as, as they happen in, uh, in Egypt, but um, I thought I'm contributing by, by being among you for uh, what we aspire for the, for the new Egypt. Um, basically, the reason why I wrote this book is that to answer many of the questions that put me as a leader or as a hero or as the, uh, as the one who sparked the revolution, as probably you have said, because I don't think all of this is right. Uh, I'm an ordinary person. I happen to use some tools, uh, which I think in the hands of every one of us and uh, everyone can, can actually make use of those tools and things have developed. I learned through the experience, which is I wanted to share those learnings with, with everyone um, and at the end of the day, tell people that this was no magical, you know, amazing behind the scenes secrets that happened that made Egypt revolt. Egypt revolted because there was a regime that was basically oppressing all the people, not because of a Facebook page or an individual calling, calling for people to go on the street. Um, I, I was born in Egypt, traveled to Saudi Arabia, lived there for 13 years, and, um, and then came back to, uh, to Cairo. I finished my school, uh, became a, you know, went to uh, comp uh, studied computer engineering and then did my MBA at uh, American University in Cairo and uh, worked for Google after probably trying six times and failing. <laughs> that was even shorter than I expected. So let's go back and, and go through a couple of things. So when you came back from Saudi Arabia as a teenager and then you went on to Cairo University, you sort of found computer engineering, but you you were very interested in technology by that point. You'd already started a website, Islam Wave, by when you were 18 or so. Yeah, I think uh, as a lot of uh, people like to call me, I'm a geek. So uh, I I love computers right. more than anything else, uh, and I like I, I believe in uh, I, once the first time I logged in the internet, I thought this is the heaven on earth uh, for me, as many would uh, would think. Uh, and I got addicted to it. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind, I want to you know, do something useful and practical. I am a Muslim, so I thought of, uh, I knew uh, a lot of people did not have access to, uh, to audio, uh, educational you know, audio and, and video stuff, uh, and the internet was still new. I, I believe Real Player was still the first big thing. It compresses audio, so I started uploading uh, audios uh, anonymously on, on a website, uh, which, by the way, I think no one have known that I was until I was released, because that's when the, you know, the current owners of the website told people while I was in the prison. Um, and I learned a lot from this experience. Uh, from which one? From the Slamway experience. Yeah, right. I, I learned a lot. I was working anonymously. I was working with different people from around the world. I, I don't know them. I've never met them. And uh, that helped me a lot develop my skills uh, online. And, you know, things kept working. I built a friendship with uh, one, of, uh, one of the guys who hired me in his startup company. It was an email company. So I had to do uh, pretty much the same thing without being anonymous. I made agreements with people I've never met. That was the whole experience. The consistent thing in the experience was that I'm, I'm always used to the virtual world. And uh, I... I think it's uh, it's a nice world uh, for for people like me. Would sometimes it, it would be better than the than the real world. <laughs> but now, uh, w w when you're at Cairo University, I'm, I'm a little unclear when you came to the United States because there's a tale behind that. And you had been communicating with a number of people, including young women, on the internet. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't agree with what, with what he said. No. <laughs> Well, tell us a little bit more about it. So I, was, I, I wanted to get married. It was very hard to get married in Egypt at a very early age. Uh, I was 18. And uh, uh, in, in the website, I started not to get married. I, I started already for, for you know, converts of Islam to communicate together, like a, a place where a lot of people meet. And I found that lady. I talked with her 
I kept, we kept chatting and uh, it turns out, you know, that's not cool. When I traveled to the US, the chances, one of my friends happened to know her and he, you know, he was recommending her for me and, and we just got married. So I found my wife online. And <laughs> but you got married within five months. I mean, this whole thing happened very quickly, yeah. right? <laughs> wow, it's unbelievable. But, but, the, but the thing about it was, you never thought you were going to meet this girl when you went to the United no. States. You had no idea, just by just total by chance. Yeah, it was a chance, and that, that was one of the reasons why it made me uh, keen on, uh, on making it happen. And thank God I'm happily married to my wife, and we've been married for 10 years now. Yeah, and with two children. Yep. But with, with a lot of issues along the way about work-life balance, because you were so committed to everything you got. Yes, to it, though. <laughs> <laughs> But she had converted by then, by the time you... Uh, no, she converted uh, before. She, she converted yeah. before you met, she met yeah. you. So you finished up at, at uh, uh, University of Cairo, but then you went on for the MBA, and your book was quite interesting about how important the MBA was uh, in preparing you uh, for your life on the MBA. That's advertising for Harvard, I think. <laughs> no, no, no. I, actually, actually we, we compete with the school across the river. Uh, if you'd come here to the Kennedy School, you'd have gotten started even yeah. earlier. But the... Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> but but you said that you learned that the, the marketing was it was really quite interesting about that. Yeah, I think the the science of marketing was was critical in in my whole career path, and I I learned a lot. And the good thing about the internet is that you can apply and see the feedback instantaneously. It's not like the, the typical marketing cycle where you can you have to wait for the ad and see the impact of it. everything online is monitored and tracked, and uh, so uh, it added a lot of. Uh, signs to the, to the skill I, I was developing over time. And I was always, I always cared about, you know, seeing ways to, uh, to change people's life. And th that's something that makes me feel, you know, feel good and keep going. And I never thought at that time when I was studying that I would use the skills I've acquired, which we can talk about uh, on, on the page, that would make a bit of a difference compared to the typical relationship between the activists or you know those who are active in the political or human rights uh, uh, area, and the audience, which is the mainstream, who is listening to what they are saying, and want to you want them to relate to it. Yeah, I want to come back to that because it's a really interesting part of your uh, uh, of your success and why it worked. But uh, let's let's walk through just a bit more through the the biography. So you came out of the university, uh, American University of Cairo, the MBA program. You came out what two thousand and five or so. Yeah. 2005. So it was only seven years ago. Less than seven years ago, you graduated. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. So, uh, but but then you went to did had a couple of internet jobs. I feel jobs. old now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you had a couple of internet jobs, and then you you but you really wanted to work for Google, and you tr you applied once, didn't get it, and then you, but you got to apply, and then you got your you got in. Yeah, I was obsessed with Google because of the fact that um, I believe internet. I always had this belief that internet can help change the world, and and I. I know this sounds very, you know, uh, cliche, or you know, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but that's just how I, how I, how I see things. And working for Google, working on a, for a company that does mass scale projects online in our region would make a difference. And I, I remember in the interview, the typical, why do you want to, you know, why do you want to go for work for Google? It wasn't absolutely the food. It was really the, the thing is. I, what I liked about Google, the, the you know, democ democ uh, democracy of, uh, you know, uh, offering people information. Probably people living here do not understand the value of that we all have equal access to information. In, in, uh, in oppressing regimes, most of the people would only get streams of propaganda into, you know, falling into their brains. And this is how the regime could sustain, besides making everyone scared, making the smart ones uh, uh, afraid and, and not willing to, to change, and the, the rest of the people who might not be fortunate enough to access other sources of information would get into the propaganda machine. So I believe the internet was, was kind of one of the forces helping in changing this equation. Right. Is that an advertisement for Google? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Google doesn't need advertising. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Facebook does either at this point. <laughs> I just remember one of my friends told me once, like, why, why you know, I, I would envy you because you work for Google for marketing, and, you know, Google doesn't really need any marketing. So what do you do all the day? <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you started working 
for Google, you were working actually in Cairo, but then they sh they asked you to relocate into Dubai in uh, January of 2011? 2010. 2010. 2010. All right, right, all right. And, th and at that time, you did not see yourself as an activist, a social activist. No, the fact is I'm an ordinary person, easily intimidated. I was part of those group of people who are always scared. They don't want to overdo things, you know. You, you know, like you have your limits. You know, you can crack jokes about Mubarak, but you're not calling for, for a protest or publicly go against it. And, and this is one of the reasons why I think credit taking, I took a lot of credit in this revolution, which is, should not, should not have happened because at that time, and I remember from 2005 until 2010, there were brave people in the, in the first line, basically going against Mubarak, paying uh, the price of it, uh, while most of us uh, on you know, the mainstream side were watching, uh, we sympathize with them, but we don't think they are doing the right thing because there is basically no hope and you are putting yourself in, uh, in danger. And that was, I think, the mentality of, of many Egyptians at, uh, at the time until things were getting worse, but we, we, we weren't seeing light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, uh, Muhammad al-Baradai was was someone who decided on he might consider running for presidency and Egyptians created Facebook page saying we want him as a president. About 250,000 uh, uh, Egyptians joined that page at the time and it, it became very active and I noticed a lot of my friends are getting into, not politics, but getting into, yes, we will go after this because we're so, uh, uh, we're so mad, we're so frustrated, we need any solution. Anything is gonna be better than what we are in and this is how I got addicted to politics. So, so as this unfolded, you saw the growing interest and then the incident of the young man who was killed in Alexandria. Khaled, Khaled Sali, Saeed, is that the way you pronounce it? Khaled Saeed. Saeed. Tell us about that because that really got you deeply engaged. So the, the whole process uh, of the change campaign with al Baradai was kind of very slow and there was one problem, which was change was personalized. Change was El Baradei. Change equaled El Baradei, despite the fact that he was, was he, he was looked upon as a savior. Yeah, right. um, and that's why I called the the second chapter "Searching for a Savior." Despite the fact that he said continuously to people that I'm not your savior. You, Egyptian people have to save themselves, but still, because of the media, you know, it's always the media that creates the, all these strong perceptions. Because of the media. It was all around him, and um, it was easy for the regime to attack. It was easy for the regime to keep, you know, defame him, say he was a traitor. He was the reason for the war in Iraq, and uh, he is uh, someone who works with Israel uh, and having an, a global agenda to, I don't know, to um, cut Egypt in pieces and all of this propaganda stuff. And people were kind of buying that. Despite the fact that no one would, you know, if you talk to everyone in the street, are you happy? They will say, no, I don't think this is the right way to go. So when, when Khaled Saeed died, I got very emotional. I got really um, frustrated seeing that this is basically the regime. They commit a lot of crimes and no one is held accountable. Um, and they keep getting more brutal and brutal and no one is stopping them. Uh, so I thought... I should use my talent in exposing the, you know, the violation, the human rights violations of the Ministry of Interior Affairs, hoping that by this exposure, they are going to, you know, create like sort of public anger, and by having this done, they would be more cautious. They would change some of their, um, you know, rules and, and conditions. Because the worst thing you can, you do to a dictator is to expose him to the to the largest number of people of his people. You counter the propaganda that they are doing. Uh, on, uh, on everyone. And it was, you know, anonymous. I started the page anonymously because of two things. Uh, one is that uh, <laughs> I want to see my kids. <laughs> I want to I wanna keep going and definitely for my personal security. And the other is because change cause should not be personalized. And be, people easily connect with causes that are not personalized because, first of all, they, they don't question the intentions. I might be doing this to take credit and to you know make, make put myself in a position uh, that you know, using their efforts and the second because 
once the idea is, is, is the leader, everyone subscribe to and own. And this is pretty much what we have seen in, in Jan 25th. That was the biggest thing I personally noticed from the 14th to 25th. Everyone was owning it as if they are the ones who called for it. And if that was, if Wa'il Ghunayim or Muhammad al Baradi or whomever asked everyone on 14th of January, let's go on 25th on the street, probably it wouldn't have succeeded. Um, and the first day, 36,000 people joined. The, the it's on your Facebook page. On the Facebook page, yeah. Uh, and the third day, we've, uh, I've reached by then 100,000. And I started thinking, you know, I, I need someone to help. And I got one of, uh, one of the guys who was helping me on the Barade page. I told him, do you want to be an admin on this page? Sure. And that guy I never met for in my life until after the revolution. Uh, and, uh, and we became, you know, we, had, we became two admins. His name is Abdurrahman, Rahman. So we became two admins managing the page until the, the revolution time. Through the experience of of go going through this ex the experience of this page, I've learned a lot of things and I've applied a lot of what I've uh, studied at school or what I've learned from previous experiences. And the most important one is, uh, is that engagism is more important than activism. So Engagement is more important than yeah, activism. Yeah, I, I call it engagism. <laughs> engagism, okay. Yeah, like at, at the end of the day, a lot of people want to have some beliefs and and start, you know, isolating themselves from the mainstream, which should not happen. What you should do is try and get the mainstream to adopt the, the beliefs. So the first thing is, it didn't feel like the page was run by the admins. Most of the, most of the time, activities or projects, ideas come from the members, and we do surveys, continuous, we use continuous, do continuous surveys to ask people what do they want to do. It was not non-confrontational. I always spoke with I, I never spoke with we. I never used the language like the regime, I always said the government. And all of that have helped with the people making the connection with the page. It was just one of us talking our language and feeling the same feelings we, uh, we have. And people were very empowered when, whenever we, uh, we make the decisions on should we go do the silent stand or not, and then people participate in, sur in the surveys. And based on the, on the result of the survey, we decide on going or not, and so on. And it kept going for months. So it had, so one of the first lessons out of this, because there were other pages uh, that were, had been developed, or at least one other page that was in memory of this young man who was killed in, in Alexandria. But they were much more confrontational, and you decided you did not want to be confrontational. You wanted people, you invite people in, in effect. Yeah, there was, there was a page that was created a few days, you know, I think uh, two days before I created the page, or one day, and that page was very famous. It had much more audience. It called, Ana Ismi Khalid Said. my name is Khalid Said. And um, the, 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 the profile page was like, we are not, uh, uh, we're not gonna leave you, you dogs of the regime. So we're going to go after you, you dogs of the regime. And uh, they were very confrontational. They had about 60,000 more members than Kulna Khaled Saeed. And they kept going in, in their very confrontational tone. And, and uh, I remember I, one time we were doing these silent stands, which is an idea by one of the members of the page who said, let's go to the street, face the beach, our back to the street, wearing black, and not doing anything for one hour. Which was to many people that was very silly, you know, very what a what a silly, stupid thing. The regime does not care about people protesting in front of the Ministry of Interior Affairs, chanting down, down Hosni Mubarak. Will they care about those who would do this uh, non-confrontational approach? And to me, and to the non-confrontational people like me, that was one of our ways to express our anger. And the fact is, the regime doesn't like this because that can attract more mainstream people into the cause, which is the very dangerous thing. I believe that dictators want their, oppress want their opponents to seem like extremists. They want to isolate them from being able to reach out to the masses. Right. Um, so back again, uh, I talked to the guy, uh, one of the admins, anonymously, and I told him, uh, can you give me the statistics of your page? So he voluntarily gave me the statistics, and it turns out the people participate in Kulina Khaled Said almost double the participations they have in their, in their page, despite the fact that they had 60,000 more members. So, so I asked him, I wonder why. 
do you, do you think why? And we started a conversation where basically I told them that your approach is the reason. People don't feel connected with what you are saying. People don't like what you are saying. You are very aggressive, you are very confrontational, and people want, want the, the tone to be as, you know, as they wanted it to be, no, as you wanted it to be. So, yeah, and you say in your book that Gandhi had been an important influence for you in thinking about this approach. Yeah, of course. I, I, I admire Gandhi for, for, his, uh, uh, for his approach and his philosophy, and I believe that um, the, more, the more I read about him, the more I, uh, I learn from what he has done, the more I think he was ultimately right. And uh, probably that's not the right approach for many people. People would argue, no, that's not going to work. And, and we ha I had these arguments with some of the revolutionaries who are more you know, aggressive and, and on the line than, than me. I, I just don't, I don't relate to what they do, and I relate more to Gandhi. And we even were cutting parts of the movie and uh, putting the Gandhi movie and uh, subtitling it and uploading it on the page to tell people. I remember one time people were very angry because of the police reaction. And I got this scene when he was in South Africa, in the movie when he was in South Africa, telling people, you know, I'm, you know, they can kill my body, they can torture my body, they can kill me, but you know, one thing they are not going to get uh, out of me, which is my obedience and respect for myself. I don't know if he said exactly that, but uh, that was the main message we wanted to give. Our, we are going to get all of our rights by being nonviolent, by actually not responding. To, to their violence by showing them that they are ugly because of what they are doing and we are, you know, civilized. So, uh, as you know, uh, Martin Luther King famously was a student of Gandhi. Made a big difference in, his, in the civil rights movement in this country. Uh, but your approach to the, to the Facebook page itself was interesting. You sort of, you said in terms of marketing, and this engagism, as you call it, which I find such an interesting I'm joking word. about it. Okay. No, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Bob Putnam, who's here on this faculty, would love that. Uh, we, we talk about civic engagement. He studies that. He'll be very interested. The, um, uh, but that you had a, like a four steps that you wanted people who came to the Facebook page to go through. Talk about that just a bit. So it was, it was like a sales tunnel to me. At the end of the day, you are convincing people of adopting a cause and being active in it. That's, that's the whole thing. That's what we are trying to do. Uh, so it starts with people liking the page and then you know, becoming active and liking, commenting to the content, and then getting active in uh, online campaigns, and finally going to the street in non-confrontational forms. So for example, the online campaigns, the, the very first one I launched was was meant to be to brand the page. Uh, so we asked people to hold up sign, to take photos of themselves holding up signs of, let's say, Kulina Khaled Saeed. Um, and the reason why, it was very important to tell the audience of the page, those are not zombies or you know, creatures not from this world. They are Egyptians. You know, my name is Ahmad, I'm 25 years old, and I will tell you Kulina Khaled Saeed. So people started to make the connection that this page has people like me. I am just like one of them. And taking to the streets was not really planned as, as uh, um, you know, as anything until this guy came up with the idea of the silent stance, which was pretty non-confrontational. I have to also say um, that now I'm, I'm analyzing what I have done. But in fact, everything that was happening was happening spontaneously and reactively and uh, without master planning. So it's very easy now to analyze and say, this is, this is the case. This is the sales tunnel. But that was, wasn't in my mind while doing what I was doing. I cannot claim something that wasn't there. What about your own personal conversion into becoming an activist? I, 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 you, you, you write in the book that the, uh, when you saw the response to the Facebook page starting to grow, that you had this nice phrase about it, 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 it brought a feelings for you, the stirrings of a rare opportunity to make a difference. That's how you expressed your, your own sense of making this commitment and really making the center, this is the center of your life. Yeah, the thing just, it gets into, into your life without meaning to do it. One, one reason is because the fact that internet is very, you know, and the feedback is very innocent and very spontaneous. You write something, you see the feedback innocently. And actually, that was one of the reasons why a lot of people were, you know, were contributing. 
they, they right away see the credit for the good things they have done. Once they upload a photo of themselves doing this, they see hundreds of likes. Others look at them and say, I want to do the same. So even the revolution, even you know, the, my readiness to sacrifice anything for, for my country, just came as in the events, as in the actions, as what, what was everything, uh, everything that was happening around us made it, made it just happen. And, made it, and I think a lot of Egyptians after the 14th, before the 14th, they would never have thought they would, they are ready to go to the street and die for a cause. And right after the 14th, every, everything completely changed and shifted. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you one last question, then we're going to ask uh, those of you who would like to participate. Uh, there are microphones here, there are two here, there should, there's one there and one there. And we'll go to your question. So if you want to ask a question, if you can start lining up now, uh, that'd be terrific. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead, I'm gonna, I wanted to ask you another question now. Uh, it was interesting, we have a, a member of the faculty here named Marshall Gans, who is a social organizer and has, dates all the way back to the... Uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Cesar Chavez in this country, and he, he uh, Obama asked him to help organize uh, some of his campaign. And Marshall raises the question, raised with me yesterday, whether the internet, well, if you look at what's happened since the revolution and the, and the elections, the people on the street, many of the people who came out to demonstrate are still disappointed that there, there's some concern, at least we read in our press, uh, that the Islamic Brotherhood has done far better in the election process than the people on the streets have done, in effect. And, the, and Marshall Gans's question is, is the internet very good at mobilizing people, but not so good at organizing people? So that you have a sort of formal, sort of, you know, party type structures. And I'm, I'm curious how, what you think about that. There's a big argument in this country about the, um, the place of the internet in social change? I think it can do, the internet is good at uh, doing both. The, the fact why, uh, it, it was only a few months before the elections took place, and um, a lot of us as activists were busy with many other things other than just the elections because there were a lot of uh, issues happening in the country. Um, and none have effectively used I haven't seen anyone effectively using the internet to organize the activities. You can definitely you know, manage campaigns online and, and make something happen out of it. Uh, yet there is one thing, I'm, I'm personally not disappointed, and I wanna make this point clear. I'm not disappointed from the election uh, uh, results, and I think I'm talking about myself, not on behalf of everyone else. I, I took to the street because I think that the Egyptians have been denied the right to choose whom they want, governing them for over 60 years. I did not take to the streets to say that X or Y or Z is the right guy and he's the one who's gonna make a difference for Egypt in the next uh, uh, five years. I believe that Egypt is far better n not without having a leader in the revolution who might have taken over and started you know, doing his version of democracy once again. Uh, it's better to have the people uh, uh, choose whom they want and then in, in few years, if you know, if, if they don't if they don't perform well, if they don't if they don't solve the problems where most of the people are actually were in the street mainly economically, I probably don't have an economic problem, but most of the people who were in the streets does have a lot of eco economic problems. If, the, if those were not solved, they are going to be out of it. Uh, as as far as there is democracy, as far as uh, uh, our we know exactly that our job is to make sure that Egypt becomes democratic electing a president, and then making sure that the democratic process is continuous and no one is hijacking it or, you know, inside it and not going to let any, uh, you know, not going to let anyone uh, uh, in, in, uh, join, I think I'm personally fine, and I believe this is one of the most important goals of the revolution. Uh, if Muslim Brotherhood wins, if any other wins, I'm fine as far as that's the Egyptian people's choice. Okay, that's very, very helpful. Why don't we go to the floor, <coughs> and, and the tradition here, as I think most of you know, is it's, uh, uh, this is a chance for questions. There's one question per customer. Uh, and if you would, re please remember. 1.99. Uh, 1 <laughs> <laughs> and please remember that each question ends with a question mark. 
Please, if you please identify yourself first. Hi, I'm Anand Gerdadas. Um, it's an honor to share a room with you after seeing you uh, from afar. Uh, a question, a slightly provincial question about the role of America in all this. Uh, it's interesting at one level that you work for one American company, you built your page on another, a platform of another American company. So there seems to be a very continued relevance for what this country does. Uh, at another level, you and many others have criticized the U.S. propping up the old regime uh, for as long as it did and not supporting the democratic aspirations uh, that you've talked about. And now in this country, there's so much worry about decline. Who are we? Do we still have a role in your part of the world and others? Uh, what do you think is the special relevance, if at all, uh, of the United States today? Wonderfully expressed question. I saw you on Twitter, by the way. <laughs> So uh, one, one thing I want to, uh, to say is, by the way, one of the reasons why I wrote the book is I'm exposed to a certain side of the story. There is no leader in this revolution, so the wisdom and the knowledge about what, hap what exactly happened, what, what led to it, could be argue, you know, argued by many people. So the fact is everyone should get all what he knows and put it you know, move it from behind the scenes to in front of everyone, and then we have analysts who look at different things. Uh, if you ask me, I think um, what made this revolution uh, uh, succeed was the Egyptian people. It was nothing to do with the U.S. And I, you know, I, at the end of the day, the U.S. is, is, is a country that wants to serve its own interests. Uh, we have a historical you know, uh, you know, multiple historical transactions where we have seen that even if those interests are against the values of the American people or the universal values that we are as human beings have agreed to. Um, so there is nothing for, for me uh, as, as someone who, you know, use logic to believe that the U.S. have pushed the revolution have, or have supported the revolution. I think the U.S. have taken sides after the fact that it was clearly going to happen. And I remember... Um, uh, Hillary Clinton saying that on on 27th, saying that the you know the government is stable, we you know our friends and and the great you know Hosni Mubarak. So that was the first part. I don't think the U.S. had anything to do. The U.S. just took sides at the end of the day, and and it was betting on the winning horse. Um, sorry. Uh, also, I think. There has been a lot of credit given to me and given to the page. I, I want to say the same thing again. The revolution would have happened anyway. This is, this is a fact of life. People were not happy, and 1,000 protests happened in 2010, and strikes uh, uh, among different workers. People were just missing the, the, trigger, the trigger, and the trigger was Tunisia. It didn't have anything to do with Egypt or... Uh, 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 sorry, it didn't have anything to do with the U.S. or, or Facebook. The treasure was really Tunisia. Um, looking at how, how technology have helped, I, I think this is pretty much away from, uh, from the, as a, you know, I wouldn't give uh, 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 the U.S. the credit for having Facebook. At the end of the day, people use tools. So I, I know I sound very bad trying to get the U.S. out of the picture because I saw on the other side a lot of credit-taking process happening in, in some of the Western newspapers about the role that the U.S. have played in the revolution. What do I want the U.S. to do to support the country? This is very personal. I want them to do nothing. I want them to stay neutral because at the end of the day, uh, if the interests of the Egyptian people uh, does go against their personal or you know the country interests, which, which I highly respect, that's normal. They are gonna basically took the you know take the side of the American people. Um, Egyptians are capable of of going through this. Uh, learning from everyone else and getting help as much as they can when it comes to the economy and so on, but we are very sensitive to interference. In fact, every time the U.S. foreign policy have, in, uh, foreign, uh, 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 policy have interfered in Egypt, it's always taken in the, in the opposite way. People don't like that. People do not appreciate the fact that the U.S. is telling us what to be done. Yet there are lots of areas where, where there should be help and I believe economy is definitely one of them. And making sure that, you know, the Egypt is going to be still an ally of the U.S. In, in a new form, a form that would have mutual respect rather than orders coming via phone lines. So I assume the rest is angry. <laughs>
sorry. <laughs> uh, Charles Kogan, uh, Belfast Center. Can you decipher for us this terrible football tragedy at Port Said? As I understand it, the Cairo team, Al Ahli, has a group of supporters. They call them the Ultras, and they're the most violent of the demonstrators. And uh, how did this happen? Was it spontaneous? Because most of the casualties are among these fans of the Al Ahli team. I think it's 67 out of 79 or something. Was this a sponsored event? Did the police stand back? Did the Al uh, Port Said team sort of have orders to attack these uh, the, the Cairo team? Can you give us some uh, some of your insights on this? So, um, for for it, does everyone know what happened? Okay. So basically, I think that I'm I don't like judging in intentions or getting into conspiracies. But what I can see clearly is that the police have done a very bad job, whether intentionally or unintentionally, uh, a very bad job that resulted in, for the first time, by the way, this number of people die in, uh, in, uh, in a soccer match in, in Egypt. And there has been a lot of rumors where people are saying they are paying the price of being against SCAF. Uh, the ultras, you know, they, before Jan 25th, they never get involved in politics and state security was always on them because they are very organized, they can do uh, a lot of you know, protests or moves, um, uh, moves and so on. I think that what happened was horrible and uh, whether it's intentional or unintentional, it's a crime. And the problem is in Egypt since 25th of January, all these incidents happened, no one has held, at the end of the day, they you know, establish all these uh, uh, fact-finding uh, committees, at the end of the day, no one, from the authorities pay the political price because this is a political crime at the end of the day. Someone has to be politically accountable for the death of all those people. And this is what frustrates people and create another wave of you know, protest that we have seen in the past couple of days. People are, do not want to protest or die for, for nothing. I have one of my friends yesterday lost his left eye. He was shot uh, on his, uh, uh, in his face. So, uh, and and he's, in, he's been hospitalized now. So I think that the situation is very critical. To me, what, what is critical or, or what is the most important thing now is to think how can we get out of this, not how this happened or why it happened. And the path is, is, uh, is according to as many people want to do, end the military rule as soon as possible through elections by, to, to get a, a president that most of the Egyptians said yes to. So we end all this vicious circle of violence that is happening right now. What would you, what would you do if you were there now? I, I would have been protesting to the movement which I belong to. We have created a political lobbying group. We are calling the parliament to, uh, um, to speed up the process of elections. The elections should start as soon as February and uh, we have a president by April, because the current roadmap suggests that Egypt will have a president by June, by end of June. Okay. Please. Hi, um, I'm Harleen, I'm an undergraduate at the college. I was wondering if you could talk about um, what uh, challenges Egypt is going to be facing in the next few years as it transitions, and then specifically what um, role you think that technology can play and if it can kind of sustain uh, the mass mobilization and the buildup of civil society that we've seen, or if it even should. So um, the biggest challenge, as, as far as I see, is the economy. Uh, Egypt, almost one out of every two people lives under $2 a day. And uh, a lot of people were saying that we are we're heading towards a poverty revolution, where the poor people are going to go you know, with ma in masses in, in the streets and start calling for you know, real change. And that would have been a di completely different style than what we have seen in, uh, in Jan 25th. Um, economy is, is a big problem. It will, it will require all the Egyptians to unite and work together. And this is why um, when we created our political movement, we had people from different groups and ideologies all together because we believe that Egypt is not going to go forward with Egypt versus Egypt mentality. Like, I am an Islamist, you are a, secu you know, a secular guy. We have to keep arguing about the ideologies while someone is you know, laying down on the floor for three months because he cannot afford going to the hospital uh, uh, to get his broken leg fixed. So economy is, is very critical. And going through the, you know, the transition of democracy has have been obviously a pain in the past one year. It's not easy. This country is recovering from 60 years of rule. And 
it will be very hard. We'll see a lot of challenges in the next few years. I think technology can play a role in spreading the awareness and getting more people empowered. The movement we've created has now we're building, we're building a system where we can organize our work together and make sure that Everyone is uh, quite well informed. The activities happen, you know, we announce them online and we take them offline and so on. Um, as well as definitely in education, there is a huge space that technology can play. But again, that is all restricted to seeing Egypt recover from the military rule, which will not happen before they go, you know, leave the politics and go back to their main job, which is the protect, protecting the country. Uh, uh, Jed Schwartz uh, from Somerville. I, uh, I see, uh, I was wondering, and wondering if you see also a, a, a grave danger that the uh, revolution will be uh, betrayed by the uh, military, that you'll be unable to overcome the uh, rationale for the military uh, rule. And uh, I, I'm sort of, uh, I mean, I'm encouraged by, by your progress so far, but uh, wondering whether uh, it would be good for some of you to begin to study uh, political philosophy, because, uh, which, which seems kind of like a non sequitur, and I, and I apologize, but uh, uh, you re remember it, it, that. The, I agree, so. Well, no, oh, you agree. <laughs> Good, because I mean, you know, like John Locke, you know, you know in Voltaire and David Hume and, and these guys who, who critiqued the, the power of the theocracy, essentially. Uh, uh, and, and it seems to me that, that if you could build on those kinds of ideas, that you might uh, be able to. Uh, overcome the the drag of of uh, fu fundamentalist uh, you know uh, 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 beliefs, which 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 uh, I I believe are retarding the economic and and social development. And if you could give me your email, I, I would be very appreciative. <laughs> Maybe now sure. or later. Now is going to be very hard. <laughs> I, I've seen a lot of discussions about the future of Egypt and, uh, and being very, um, very worried about the Islamists ruling the, the, the country. I mean, I have my opinion. I could be wrong. I could be naive, as, as you've mentioned. I, I don't have a problem admitting that. Um, I think that if we look at the history of Egypt in the past uh, probably a couple of hundred of, of years, you know, Egypt was colonized by the French people, and hardly any Egyptian speaks French. Uh, while, you know, if you look at other nations that were colonized by the French people, probably they speak more French than they speak Arabic. And, uh, you know, the British people colonized Egypt, and also most of our people speak broken English, as you can tell. Uh, and and uh, the Shia, one religious example, the Shia came to Egypt to build the largest institute that spreads the Shia belief across the Arab world, and it ended up with the largest Sunni organization. I, don't, I, I pretty much don't believe in the fact that you can enforce change on people. And if that happens in Egypt, where the society is very main, you know, moderate and mainstream, that will go completely the opposite way. That's one thing. And the second, I know about the media fuss going on, but I have been in meetings, and I think uh, private meetings with the different parties, the ones who are in control now of the parliament, they have the majority. I think there has been a lot of uh, uh, you know, misconceptions and they are dragged into discussions and we need to sort of put aside the preconceived uh, uh, beliefs about them and put them in the real, on the real stage. We want you to perform more, you know, to solve the economy problem. This is what the taxi driver in e Egypt who voted for the Muslim Brotherhood wants. He wants them to fix the problems of the country, not to tell them how to work, you know, not to tell him how to worship God. Good, please. We're going to have time for, I think, a couple more. We'll see where we are. Uh, hello, my name is Vasu Sankara. I'm with the economics department here. And I was thinking about specifically Egypt's youth and sort of the transition that people have made in being more interested in politics. I was hearing about your own personal story with Al Baradé and the Facebook page. And then personally today, um, one of my acquaintances in Egypt, and he was active in a protest, and there was a comment of be safe. And I was just thinking, is if you see this as a, kind of a next stage in Egypt's progress, um, and simultaneously I know that the youth are one cross-section of a broad societal movement, but do you think there is a certain path in terms of what would be maybe most constructive, such as the youth being uh, lobbying, as you were saying, to mm. oversee the democratic process, 
or the youth actually participating and running for office in existing political parties, or none of these options? And if there is one specific thing that comes to mind, what do you think is the biggest challenges for making that actually be realized? Thanks. I think that's one of our biggest challenges at the moment, and how to institutionalize those who take to the streets, those brave people who are ready to die, facing tanks and you know, uh, uh, sacrificing their lives. How can we move that from this to political participation? And we haven't done good efforts so far in it. And unfortunately, most of the, the, the parties uh, have put you know, senior people, mostly senior people in, uh, in, uh, as candidates, so only very few young guys uh, have went, you know, managed to run uh, for parliament and, and actually won. There's a 27 years old guy, for example, in the parliament for, for the first, he's the youngest guy ever in the history of the Egyptian parliament and there's a 30 years old guy and so on. Um, what, what we are, what I'm personally hoping uh, to, to do and to see is to get people more involved in the lobbying groups and eventually also getting people running for offices. There is uh, election, we have local community elections uh, taking place in, uh, in a few months. And basically this is for the people who serve the small districts. And this is more, uh, more of a job that the young people should, should get in. Uh, whether they will be able to win or not, we have to do some pressure on the parties to make sure that they support the, young, the youngsters. Uh, because they are the ones, they are the future of the country, and they are the ones who basically showed that they are not happy and they can flip things around and everyone then join them. Please. Thank you, Sheikh Hamid uh, a graduate of the college. Um, I know you're an optimist about uh, Egypt's future, but we all know that Egypt plays a pivotal role in the politics of the Arab world, and other countries are looking towards Egypt to see what will happen in Egypt, especially you know, opposition movements in other countries. Uh, the tragic events unfolding over the last few months um, have given pause to a lot of these groups. And now people say, well, maybe there's, this, uh, there's a fallacy that things can never get any worse. And, you know, there's a dictator, but we're putting food on the table. It's generally safe if, you don't, if you're not involved in politics. So this idea that things can't get any worse, well, maybe they can. So, in which case, maybe we should just say, it's OK, settle for the status quo. Um, and you're seeing that with large segments in countries that are being ruled by probably even more brutal dictators. I'm curious about your views on kind of the, uh, the role Egypt has, which it has historically had uh, towards Arab countries in, ter in terms of leading. Um, so I'm not an this. optimist by choice, by the way. I, I get uh, I want to see the good side of the story, and I know there is a very bad side of it. And uh, I, I, I read and I see how can you look at this negative side. I just believe that being frustrated is not going to bring us forward. Being frustrated is not going to be good for the people. People want to see hope, and they, they don't want to see frustration. That's why I'm an optimist. Do I see the challenges that Egypt is going through? I definitely see them, and I... I I think it's not it's not easy at all, and I sometimes I get frustrated and sit down and you know really worry about the the country and its uh, and its future. But I try to keep myself on the optim optimistic side. Egypt is definitely um, a role model for a lot of the Arab world countries. Uh, I think it's if if anyone thinks that the next few years are going to be you know amazing and great and everything is going to go in the right direction, probably they are short-sighted because after all when when you have cancer and you take you know you, you go through uh, chemotherapy a lot of things bad things happen to you but eventually you get there and and uh, and you get better and by the way that was one of the problems of the revolution was the very high expectations that were given to the people if mubarak is out all the problems will be solved in fact part of our political naivety I, I don't see him, uh, is, is that we generally start to think that. And I'm, I'm not a political expert. I have, I have thought that we would get in a better situation. But now as we're learning, we know it's, it's much more complicated. So for, for those young guys, I would say, yes, you are in a, in a bad situation. It could get worse when you revolt, yet eventually the future will be much better because generation, you know, a generation after yours is going to enjoy real democracy, and those who are ruling you are going to be uh, uh, accountable for everything they are doing. Last question. And, and by the way, one funny thing. I was praying right after the 14th of January that nothing bad happens in Tunisia. 
because if something bad happens in Tunisia, I remember the newspapers were basically distributing all the stories about, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, people robbed a bank in Tunisia. Uh, a bunch of people got, uh, got killed in Tunisia because the regime wanted to tell people it could, it, it will get worse if we do like them. That's very interesting. Last question. Uh, hi, I'm Micha Sifri. I'm teaching here at the Shorenstein uh, Center, of course, on politics of the internet, and I run the Personal Democracy Forum. Um, well, you're an Egyptian, I'm an American, but we are both netizens of the undemocratic republic of Facebook. <laughs> um, in your case, you both used Facebook in some amazing ways, but at a critical moment, your Facebook page was shut down arbitrarily. It was a crisis. And luckily for you, you were able to scramble with some help of others to get it turned back on. But my question in general is, should activists trust Facebook? And what should we netizens ask of companies like Facebook to make them safer places to use for the kind of work that people like you do? Yeah, so the, my Facebook, the page was shut because uh, I was managing it from an anonymous account, uh, an, uh, a fake account. And Facebook has a, strat you know, a policy that basically uh, you cannot uh, use Facebook with uh, with fake identities. So when people reported the page right before the Egyptian parliament elections, there was a huge number of you know act government activists uh, reporting the page. Uh, Facebook looked and was like, okay, that administrator is fake. This looks like a bad page. Close, and they closed it. Um, and as you mentioned, we got it back through connections. I think that. Uh, your people had to take or put their names on it, right? Yeah, uh, there, is, uh, there is an Egyptian uh, uh, American lady, her name is Nadine Wahab, she offered help and she said, you know, listen, I'm, uh, I, can, I can put my name on, uh, on, on the page, I don't mind. So, uh, so it was, the, the, the ownership of the page was transferred to her and, uh, and the page got recovered. The in, you know, there, there has been interesting debates about the, the, fake identity, the fake identities and the real identities, uh, or the decisions that Facebook takes to, uh, uh, you know, they think it's, it's the right one. I believe that as, what did you say, netizens, <laughs> uh, uh, we should, there are two things. We, you, you can always pressure, you know, these companies. At the end of the day, it's a company. Uh, you have no control over it. You haven't, you, you know, you, don't, you should not basically uh, elect its, uh, its, its president who runs it, only the shareholders have the right to say. You either you know, do pressure on them for, for the change you are seeking, uh, or abide, abide to the regulations and deal with what you have. Uh, I don't personally trust any tool. I trust the people behind the tool. If Facebook uh, all of a sudden decides no politics in, uh, in, in Facebook, we're gonna shut down everything. Or, of course, it's not gonna happen, but if that happens, we will find uh, another tool. I was using a survey tool throughout the whole page experience, which had hundreds of thousands of votes. Um, and I discovered on the night of 10th of February that it was a, you know, a small company run by two people from their apartment uh, in, the, in the US. So people will always find the tools that will make them work in the way they want. Uh, and Companies like Facebook, as, as they become big, it, it becomes very, uh, uh, it's, it's a huge responsibility on them on the, and their actions. Our job is to just make our voice loud and clear for whatever we don't agree with. There are an awful lot of people here, I'm sure, just about this. You've packed an awful lot into 32 years. You're very young. Where do, where do you go from here? Uh, to the book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, I, I have to say, I'm happy. Uh, I, I, on, on the 8th of February, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was released, when I saw all the events taking place, uh, I wrote that we will win because we don't understand politics, uh, because we are naive. We will win because we, uh, we are dreaming. And to many people, the dreams were impossible. But those people, you know, to us, this dream will happen or we will sacrifice our life for it. 
What exactly will I do? I, I don't know. And I, I don't think I should know because things are, have been changing completely. I'm very spontaneous. I'm very reactive. A lot of the stuff that happens on the page, um, uh, you know, happens because it just, you know, someone writes a comment and I, and I react to it. I know for many established people, this is something very, uh, very bad. And uh, we'll talk for, forever about, you know, the importance of strategizing and, you know, thinking about looking at, you know, putting a long-term plan and having a vision. I've learned all that in the school. Uh, but <laughs> but I, I, for me, I'm, I'm going to do my best. I love my country. I'm are so... You, are you living in Cairo now? Uh, yeah, most of the time. I, I love my country. I'll do most of what I can do for its people. Uh, the moment uh, I see, you know, most of the Egyptians proud and, and we, we, you know, systematically solve the problem of poverty in, in this country, uh, then uh, probably I'll come to Harvard, do an MBA, and learn the real. Ah, well, you're, you will always be welcome at the Kennedy School. We would love to have you come back. I do want to say, I, I, I got this note that uh, I, actually it's 150. I had not appreciated that two co-sponsors, the Institute of Politics and the Center for Public Leadership have, jo have jointly purchased 150 books. Uh, and they will be there for the first 150 people who come through the Charles. So I, I also want to say that all the proceeds of this book is going to. Uh, I'm not getting anything of it. I think it's unfair that people died and I become a millionaire out of the book. Um, so uh, so all of the proceeds are going to uh, to Egypt to uh, NGOs and the families of martyrs and injured people. I I. I well, Ghanim, I think you can tell from the response of this uh, audience tonight we, how much uh, we, we appreciate your humility, Thanks. but we also very, very much appreciate what you've done and how you've championed and become a champion of, of freedom and democracy in the world. Thank you. Thanks.